Good evening. Good evening. Don't all jump in at once. We are talking about prayer tonight, so I think we should open with prayer. Uh, somebody want to pray, or I'd be willing to pray. Any takers? All right. Thanks, Robbie. Lord, thank you that we get to uh, talk about prayer tonight. And when I come to you um, before we even jump into it, in prayer. Uh, thank you for it, and thank you that we get to communicate with you. Lord, we pray for those who might be traveling here tonight. Um, Lord, just uh, bless those who are arriving. And, uh, God, we just pray for a really good time for us to learn. And I pray that we would fall more in love with prayer and communicating with you, Lord. That we love you and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's start with the definition of prayer. I'm going to share a definition that I found offered by Wayne Grudem. Then I'm just going to ask if you want to modify it, edit it, think about it. He says, prayer is personal communication with God. Pretty simple. Not overly complicated. Did he get it right? I think it can be corporate communication with God. Ah, prayer is corporate communication or could be. So you could you would say maybe prayer is personal or corporate communal yeah. communication with God. That's a good addition. That's a good catch. Anybody else? I like that. That's very good. We should call up uh, Dr. Grudem. <laughs> so what about corporate prayer? Why is that important? Why is it? I mean, that's a really good addition. Why is that important? We think a lot about personal prayer, don't we? But we don't too often think about the significance of God's people praying together. We see numerous accounts of God's people being called to pray together. And the value of God's people praying together. That's a really good addition. Anybody else want to modify or edit or offer a suggestion? I could go the other way and just say prayer is communication with God. Prayer is communication with God. All right. And what would be the risk? There might be a risk. Why would why would personal or communication be helpful in that statement? What if prayer was communication with God, like a group of people? built a stack of rocks in a circle where somewhere like this and somewhere like that and it was actually an effort to send a message to a possible god who doesn't know us and we don't know him like putting rocks out on the on an island and say help you know and the airplane flies over and finally sees the call on the island and rocks for help and they get down there and there's a skeleton sitting wake so that i think there's something about that personal aspect that says it's not just it's not just us sending a signal out to communicate or God to send a signal back. There's some relational piece there. I'm not saying you're wrong. I think you could make it really tight. Prayer is communication with God, but I think there's an importance of the personal well, and think, an importance with the corporate. I think also, I mean, when we're talking about prayer, it's us communicating with him and him communicating with us, but he also communicates with us in ways that aren't prayer. Ah, that's like true. Through his word, or he can communicate through dreams and visions and other means. Yeah. Um, Do we communicate with God through other means besides prayer? I heard a mm hmm. What, what do you think? How do we communicate with God in ways that aren't prayer? By I the creation. By. Uh, adoring or enjoying, I wasn't sure if I heard that right, by just our affections and our love. But what were you going to say, Daniel? That's a good one back there, too. But Oh, Josiah said it, so you're not going to claim credit for it. In worship and praise and adoration, which worship can be enjoying his creation, singing praises back to him. I mean, there's uh, lots of ways in which we can communicate with God as well. Okay, so let's jump into this. And I'm, you know, in the last few classes have just gone through some of what Grudem had, and I summarized some scripture, but I really felt like it would be valuable in this class to go to the scripture themselves, because it's, it's fascinating the places where we hear about um, prayer and we're taught to pray from God's word. So I want to start with just the question, why do we pray? I mean, okay, someone go to Matthew 6, verse 8. We're going to do this together a little bit. So when someone so we'll do some uh, we'll do some speed drills. When you got it and you want to read it, say got it. And then Matthew six eight. Who's I'll be really happy if all these paper Bibles can beat the digital Bibles. <laughs> that will be. I usually I think I can get to them faster okay. in my paper Bible than I can. Oh, he 
We got it right here. Daniel, read for us Matthew chapter 6, verse 8, nice and loud. Don't be like them, because your father knows the things you need before you ask. Them. Okay. Your father knows the things you need before you ask. So what's the point? Why, why bother praying? That doesn't even make sense, does it? If he just knows what we need. And we've talked about him being outside of time, so he already sees the end and the beginning. What would possibly be the point? But the point is, and we'll look at some scripture with this too, with, with all of this, we see in repeated circumstances God calling his people to be in community and communion with him. We see that throughout the Old Testament. We see that in the New Testament. And prayer is a way in which we have personal communication. We're in, in communion with God. He wants us to be in community with God. Let's think about this for a second. We talk about the Trinity. Jesus is the second member of the Trinity. Jesus is God. Do we have any examples in the Bible of Jesus during his earthly ministry praying? Yes. yes. Why would he need to pray? He says that to be in, he's in union and community with God, but he says it. I said this for those who hear. I forgot where that scripture is located. He he makes that known. He's like, this is this is one thing. It's for community. You're small now, uh, let me see if I can fix that real quick on the recording. People watching probably only see the one, but the recording is fine. It's in here. Let's see here. Pin. There we go. All right. So uh, God wants us to be in community and communion with Him. Jesus prayed a lot. How about John chapter seventeen? The entire chapter, you know what that is? That's Jesus' prayer. A whole chapter of Jesus praying. He's praying for his disciples. He's praying for God's will. He's even praying for us and those who would come after. That's a, a prayer and a great example, which will be important when we come back to when we get all the way down to the house section. I'm just going to put it out there now. Sometimes you read, don't, don't pray for very long or only pray in your prayer closet in, in silence. But let's not forget that Jesus has an entire chapter where he prayed with his disciples. We see him going up on a mountainside to pray on his own. We see him doing all sorts of things. Um, but again, we come back to the question, why pray? If God knows before we ask. Someone go to James chapter 4, verse 2. Who can get there the fastest? Oh, Robbie got that one. He was quick on that one. What is James chapter 4, verse 2? Nice and loud for us. You desire and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and wage war. You do not have because you do not ask. Okay, wait a second. God knows what you need before you even ask. And James chapter 4, verse 2 just said you don't have because you don't ask. Oh, interesting. He knows what you need before you ask, but you might not even have if you don't ask. How about that? How about the parable Jesus shared of the woman who pestered the judge. That was the instruction for how we're to pray. Constantly, constantly saying, hey, wh why? Because there's this, this idea of like being with and constantly being in that community. There's a, uh, there's a phrase that says we should be praying unendingly. Who knows where that's at? Be joyful, always pray continually. That one, yeah, makes them all things. It's first Thessalonians 5 17. 17. Yeah. Be praying always. Now, do you think, let's think about this for a minute, is it possible that that is uh, making a statement that you should be praying often? You should be that. I mean, I think there's an idea here that you realize that you're going to be sleeping once in a while and things like that. But the point is, the very bulk of you and who you are. So this should be, this should mark your life. You should be doing this so much that, that you are in that much communion and community with God. Now, still the question, why do we pray? I think if we go to, if you would turn to Exodus 32, just, I'm going to, I'm not going to get into this in great detail, but I am going to just encourage you kind of skim through this. A few interesting things happen here in Exodus 32, don't they? God and Moses are having an interaction. And God is going to destroy the people, right? He's going to destroy the people. And Moses, 
intercedes for the people. And by doing so, God, some translations will say changes his mind. Some translations will say relented. Moses says, hey, how are you going to get the glory if you just wipe your people out? If you can, God, you, you shouldn't do this. There should be forgiveness for them. And God changes the course of his action. And there are people that really struggle with that. Does that seem right? God was going to do something. Moses, in community with God, pleaded with God, interceded, and then God didn't do something. What do you think of that? Does it, do people say it doesn't seem right because God shouldn't change if he says he's going to, you know, because like scripture says God doesn't change, right? That's the idea, right? So did, so did God himself change? Maybe it's similar to the, the thing he read in James, though, where you don't have because you don't ask. So like maybe God was intending to not destroy them and to relent if he was asked, you the, know, you have like there might be circumstances where we don't get what we want if we don't ask. Okay. And part of the idea that God doesn't change is God didn't necessarily change. Although that would suggest some people think, oh, he changed his mind, but maybe he didn't change his mind. Maybe what Lisa is saying is there's some conditions here and the conditions are, and I'm going to put some heavy language here in hopes that maybe you pick up what I'm, what I'm getting at. The conditions are the people were sinning, but Moses, we find out in a Psalm, stood in the breach. In fact, let me tell you what Psalm that is. He stood in the gap on behalf of the people. In fact, he interceded for sinful people. That is, uh, what Psalm says that? Let's see. That sounds close. We got a guess for 106 or right. I don't know. I have it written here in my prayer book, so I'm looking for it really quick. It's probably faster for me than actually looking through all the Psalms. Um, Psalm 106, 23. Psalm 106, 23. It was 106. Good job. God would have destroyed the people had not Moses stood in the gap or stood in the breach or interceded on their behalf for those sinners. He pleaded that God would, would change his mind or God would not administer to them the punishment that he said was due to them. Do we have any other examples? God doing that? Maybe examples for us? Jonah. What was that? Uh, for... Jonah is another good example. If they go and if they repent, then God will not destroy them. But if they don't repent, then God will destroy them. How about another example? Abraham. How about a personal example in your own life? Well, I deserve the punishment of death for my sins. and. Jesus interceded for me. Jesus interceded. Moses is a picture of or a type of intercessor where Jesus is the greater intercessor. And had not that intercessor engaged, we would be facing the punishment of our sin that we deserve. I mean, that's a picture. So when people get upset about that, like, thank the Lord that Moses prayed for them. And, and thank you, Jesus, that you interceded for us. Now, in that case, it might not be so much about prayer because, and it may be so much, but Moses had to pray because Moses didn't have the ability like Jesus had. And, and Jonah probably should have prayed and didn't and was cranky about it. But the point here is prayer does have an impact and God wants us to be in a relationship with him. I'll share, and I have no, other than what we just talked about, I don't have a biblical precedent for this, but sometimes I think God actually waits for us to pray so that we have no option but to credit him. Yeah. You're doing everything you can do. You're working on this. You're working on that. But then you pray and ask God to do it. It's kind of hard to say, oh, well, look what I did after you just asked God to do something. Or when God does it, you go, that's amazing. Every, I mean, I was at my wit's end or I was helpless. And I prayed and that made God get the credit. And if you don't do that, then God doesn't get the credit. I mean, he should, but... It's really hard not to give him credit when you just ask him to do something and then he does it. Mm -hmm. So I think, why do we pray? So that we can have that personal relationship, communication with him. So that he gets the credit. So that we're fully aware it wasn't us because we had to humble ourselves and ask God. So that we can see God working. So that we are aware that we also might be interceding like Moses interceded or stepping into that power that Jesus has said, hey, do the work 
that I do. Um, prayer. So we're obedient. We're going to come back to that too. Yeah, we're called to pray. And like Lisa just said, that's obedience. You know, that if we're called to do that, we need to do it. And so why pray? Because it's significant and it's important. Let me give you another one though. And this, we've shared this a lot. We, we call our prayer group House of Prayer. At Old Redeeming Life, before the service, we would all gather around and shut down everything. All operation would stop. If you're in the middle of making coffee, just stop. If you're doing a sound check, when we hit a certain time, everything stopped. We all gathered around. We called it House of Prayer. And inevitably, someone would come to me and go, you know, there's an international house of prayer, this whole thing. I said, it's not that. Although their name probably comes from some of the same meaning. So I'm going to walk us through it. And some of you who've done this with me know. Um, in the Old Testament, where did God dwell? Where was God's house? The tabernacle or the temple. It was the tabernacle. And then at one point, I went, oh, David said, we're living in fine houses, but God's house at that point was 500 something years old. The tabernacle, I mean, can you believe the tabernacle went 500 years? Anyway, God's house was not as nice. So we have to build God's house. That's where God dwelled. That's where he lived. Tabernacle or temple. Now let's fast forward a little bit. Jesus walks into the temple. He sees the money changers and they're, they're doing wrong and they're making an interest and they're taking advantage of the people bringing the animals and all that stuff. And he gets a little upset. He flips over the tables. He makes it. He braids with him, whips the animal. He just like causes all sorts of chaos. He calls those guys a den of robbers or thieves. And then he says, what? You have made my house what? Den of robbers. But my house is to be what? A house of prayer. So he's saying, well, the... The temple, the tabernacle, is to be a house of prayer. Okay, so we have prayers happening in the tabernacle. That's good. And then let's fast forward a little more. Let's think about this as we get into uh, the letters from Peter, the letters to the Corinthians from Paul. Uh, where does God dwell now? Where is God's dwelling place, his house? There's two, there's two answers. They're both right. Where does God take up residence or where's his house today? Oh, yes. Oh, well, yes, heaven. Okay, there's three answers. But on earth, where is his tabernacle? Where's his tent? Uh -huh. Our hearts. He, so God dwells in us. We are his tabernacle, right? We are his dwelling place. Where else? This would be if you kind of go towards Peter. Corporately in the body. Is right. Corporately in the body is right. His, Peter says that we are each a living stone in the house that God is building. The church, not the church building, but the people corporately are the house of God and individually are the house of God. Do you think that Jesus' statement, which is quoted out of, I believe, Isaiah and the Psalms as well, I think, about God's house to be a house of prayer, do you think the purpose of God's house is still the same? I do. So that means we should be the place of prayer individually. And we should be the place of prayer corporately. We are a house of prayer. Prayer should be there. That this, You've made my father's house a den of robbers, but it should be a house of prayer. We should be a house of prayer corporately. and individually. So why pray? Because we've been told to pray. Because that's an act of worship. That's an act of our obedience. And prayer is personal communication with God. Okay, someone go to 1 Timothy 2.5. It's a race. Let's see who's going to get there. You're saying, God, you're already there, really? Yeah. Wow, that was fast. <laughs> <laughs> so do you want to read it since you got there? Sure. No. no, no, no. God and one mediator between God and humanity, the man in Christ Jesus. Who did. You want me finish or not? Uh, we can stop there, but it's Jesus. There's one mediator between man and God. Now let's think about what we just talked about with Moses. There's one mediator, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ makes our prayers possible. And if it were not for Jesus, I don't think our prayers would have that kind of an impact. So it's Jesus who makes the prayers possible. We're commanded to pray. Um, we're told to pray in Jesus' name. Someone, not Robbie, go to John 14, 13 through 14. <laughs> 
John 13, verses 13 through 14. Okay, Robbie, you can go now. I gave everybody a head start. I got it. Uh, <laughs> oh, Daniel was almost there too. John 14, verses 13 through 14. What does that say? Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Okay, what I'm about to share with you, some of you are probably not going to love. Maybe, you, maybe you'll be okay, there, but I want you to think carefully here. If I ask for anything, and at the end of it, I say, I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Am I guaranteed to get those things? No. So that must not be how we ask in Jesus' name, is it? How do we ask for something in Jesus' name? In line with Jesus and God's will. Oh, in line with God's will. Was a, that's a good answer. We might want to add, we're going to maybe build on this a little bit. How else do we pray in Jesus' name? Now, let's think about how we would use that sort of thinking in other ways. Go ahead. You're going to ask. We're talking about Christians, right? Yeah, we're talking about Christians. Okay, just making sure. Okay, but so how would I, um, how would I make a statement, a declaration in the name or in the authority of the king? Uh, let's say I was sent somewhere. Or, or uh, let me uh, can I walk can I walk down to Bountiful? Let's let's try this. Can I walk down to Bountiful Main Street right down here? And can I say by order of the president, you guys all have to go to the ice cream shop? <laughs> Do I have the authority to say that? No. Can I <laughs> can I function in the name of the president or the name of the United States government in that way? No, you're not an ambassador. I have not been made an ambassador. I've not, I don't have the ability. Could I speak on behalf of the Crumb family? <laughs> if I'd like. Well, what just happened just now? She gave you authority. You gave me permission. You gave me authority. But what if you didn't want me to speak on behalf of the Crumb family? <laughs> We do this in the law. Take it, we, <laughs> take it up with the husband. We do this with like a power of attorney, don't we? Someone gives power for someone else to act in their authority. When someone has a power of attorney, what are they doing? They're functioning as if they're that other person in what they've been given authority to do, aren't they? Jesus is saying, I'm giving you the power of attorney to ask for the things you ask in my name, basically meaning the things that I would give you the authority to do or the things that I would say you can say. But you can't necessarily just ask for the things you want in my name because I haven't given you the authority to do that. I've given you the authority. And that's what Lisa was saying in the will. We're going to read some other scriptures here in a little bit uh, about the same thing. But if you're praying along the same lines as Jesus and in the will of Jesus, Anything you pray for will be granted to you because Jesus has the authority to grant anything that's done in such a way. So if we're praying in Jesus' name, we don't have to say, and I pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen, at the end of our prayers. Because we're doing it with Jesus dwelling in us. The Holy Spirit is a seal on us. We're doing it in the authority that he's giving us. We're doing it in his will. We're doing it in accordance with his word. We're doing it in accordance with what he has sent us to do and the mission that he has given us and the permission that he has given us. And anything that's outside of his will and outside of his name ain't going to happen because he didn't authorize you to say that or do that. So when he says, if you pray for anything in my name, that's what he's meaning. Now, we remind ourselves of that by saying we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, but we just need to be aware. It's not just that we said we did it. I said I was representing the president. And nobody took me seriously. But if I have the authority to represent the Catherman family, because I'm a Catherman, let me go, oh, okay, we can take him seriously. Or if I have a power of attorney, or if I have a, a commission from the president of the United States to go do this particular task, or I'm an ambassador or something like that changes the whole dynamic and so really what we have in in praying in jesus name is we're putting on his jersey because we are christians we're now called his name see how that works and so we're, we're called to to pray through his name why because he makes it possible right and that's the power one of the many wonderful powers we're given as as christians can a lost person pray and have God answer those prayers? 
I would certainly hope so, because how in the world would they cry out and ask for God's forgiveness and love? And But we're going to be more likely or more inclined to pray in God's will, aren't we? Because we hopefully should be living in his name, not taking his name in vain. It's the same command. It's not that we just don't say his name in a certain way. It's that we actually represent his name, the family name. We live in that authority. So when we take the Lord's name in vain, we're doing something inappropriate in that. When we're praying in the Lord's name, we're actually doing something right. Praying. So that's the idea of that in name. Okay, now, this one's good. I think if we would all go to Matthew 6, we're going to look at... We're going to look at Jesus' answer to the question, how do we pray? And we're going to get it from Jesus. Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 15. Oh, I see that you're still racing over there, and I do appreciate it. Who got there first? <laughs> I think Daniel probably did. Um, just for the sake of the recording, I think I'll... I'll read this. I said six, but it's actually, oh no, five, five through 15. Matthew chapter six, verse five through 15. This is coming from the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is teaching and he says this, whenever you pray, what's the topic of what we're learning? Prayer, prayer. prayer. Whenever you pray and listen to all the things he says, let's just kind of have, I didn't bring the whiteboard. We could have written them down. You must not be like the hypocrites. Well, what does that look like? But because they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by people. Right? Sometimes it, we have this, this discussion of heaping up more and more words and being seen in some other places. Okay? They're, they're doing it for their own benefit to be seen as holy rather than to be in community with God, having that communication, all those things. So let's see. Uh, I tell you, they have their reward. What reward is he talking about? To be seen. To be seen. <laughs> they got what they wanted. Why would we be praying? Hopefully for more than to be seen by others. Oh, look, you're, you're great. Look at how holy you are. Well, there's more to this than that. Well, they've already got what they wanted, so more power to them. Verse 6. But when you pray, because that was the negative, so now we're going to go into your private room. Shut your door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Now let's pause for a minute. Let's put this in the right context of what he's saying. Is he saying that all prayer should be private? He couldn't possibly be saying that because here in just about four more sentences, he's going to pray and show us how to pray. Other times he prayed publicly. Remember John 17? He prayed with the disciples. He didn't go in his closet. So in context, it's not that all prayer must be secret, or there'd be no such thing as corporate prayer. In context, what did he just say? The hypocrites who are doing it wrongly are praying to be seen. Your prayer should have nothing to do with being seen. He's drawing a clear contrast. Do it in secret. Because if you do it in secret, your father still sees and absolutely sees, whereas they were being seen by who? Note the words, if you were going to draw connections, they're praying to be seen by people, verse 5, but you go in and your father sees you in secret. See that connection? So the point isn't that we always pray in a prayer closet, that you're seen without all the people seeing you, and, that, and then you, you will be rewarded. Who's rewarding you? The father. What reward did they have? The reward of people and man and fame and whatever they were looking for. That's the contrast there. So this is not a command to always pray secretly. When you pray, so he's assuming you're going to pray, don't babble like the Gentiles, since they imagine they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, because your father knows the things you need before you ask him. All right, so what he was getting at there was this idea of something like, if I pray this prayer 55 times, I'll get it, right? And I'll put on a little prayer bead thing, and I'll do it over and over. And I've seen many, I've been in many cultures where they do that. Same prayer over and over and over and over. Now, sometimes I've seen prayer beads where you pray this thing, then you pray that thing, and it's a tool to help. But just saying it over and over and over and over again isn't going to increase anything. You saying, look, God knows what you need. He just wants you to ask. So can you pray short prayers? Absolutely. I'm trying to think of, uh, I think Nehemiah might have had the shortest prayer I'm aware of in the Bible. 
He was beckoned by the king and he said, and he prayed and spoke. Like he was like, I'm going to pray. Then I'm talking to the king. So I, I can't even imagine how much time he had other than Lord help me. And then he's talking to the king. Okay. And then we have a whole chapter, of Jesus praying an entire chapter recorded in our Bible. But also we had Jesus praying overnight on mountainsides. We had Jesus going into the garden and the disciples were back here a little ways. And, and he prayed so long, they just kept falling asleep. So it's not that every prayer has to be short or every prayer has to be long. It's that don't just keep thinking if you just repeat some mantra, you're going to be guaranteed what you want. He's, you're having a personal communication. You're not trying to wrench something out of God by doing some formula. That's really what we're talking about. So now then he says, uh, therefore, you should pray like this. And he gives us what is often called this model prayer, this demonstration prayer. And before I go into this, I want to talk about translation a tiny bit here. This is one of the most difficult issues for Bible publishers. It just, it just kills them. If they translate this in the best words for our English today, in the, in the, the translational theory they're going for, often the prayer sounds different than sometimes what we either were accustomed to or what we want it to be. And so there are translations sometimes that will still switch their translational philosophy and make it sound more like the King James or something more holy and magnificent. But the truth is, Jesus is talking in a very common vernacular. He's not using, you know, like, hallowed be thy name. This is honor. They didn't go that direction, right? But we don't say hallowed in a regular language. When was the last time any of you said hallowed? So that's a weird thing that you would regularly be praying that. You don't even say that. When you look in the Greek, he's not putting extra special, extra reverent language. He's putting communal communication for individuals like these he's preaching to, to pray. So that says, therefore, pray like this. Our Father in heaven. Our Father. There's a corporate thing. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And he's talking about the will of God happening here. We want to be within your will. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. It's difficult there because there's a translation you could also put in there like trespasses. Trespass has more of a sense of violating the law. Debt has more of a sense of, of paid in full. It is finished. And so translators sort of have to go with, it's a tough word, but we have debts or trespasses. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. There's also, you probably have some footnotes about either the evil one or uh, evil in general. That's a real tricky translation issue, but that's the model. And there's a format for you that you could follow. Uh, it starts out with worship. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. The sense of praise and a sense of worship. Here's a model. Your kingdom come, your will be done. A sense of submission to the Lord. Then there's a sense of some intercession. Give us today our daily bread, the needs. You know what I like about this daily bread? Uh, how much bread are you going to get? A day's worth. It didn't say give us the bread for the month, so I don't have to pray until next month. Give us our daily bread. Hey, Lydia, would you do me a favor? Would you go out and get a couple of those, some of those prayer, prayer bookmarks. Do you know the green ones? Or Daniel, would you run out? With, uh, you can do it, right, Lydia? They're the green bookmarks up in the up in the bookmark folder. Um, so we're praying for daily needs. And then verse 12 is praying for forgiveness of, as we have also forgiven our debtors. It's a little tough to pray that if you haven't asked for that, which we're going to read in the verse that comes after. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. There's a sense of just pleading and intercession and praise. Verse 14. Oh, here we go. Thank you. Verse 14. For if you forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive others, your Father will not forgive your offenses. Then he goes on, he shifts to the topic of fasting. It's fascinating to me. There are other places where he's actually asked, teach us how do we pray? Show us how to pray. So one of the only things that disciples asked for guidance and help in, and he's specifically teaching that, but all throughout the Bible, it's assumed we pray, and yet we struggle with it, don't we? It's a struggle. So we have these bookmarks. 
this is just another method that might help you. It's it's uh, ador yep, adoration, confession, supplication, intercession, kind of following a little bit of that formula. It's just a little bookmark. You're more than welcome to grab one of these. There's lots of extra spaces if you want to put other notes, things that would help you to pray. But obviously, if the disciples were asking, if Jesus was teaching, this is something that just doesn't come naturally to most of us. We have to we have to learn and we have to work at it. And that's why it's right here, even in this case. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conclude the teaching part, and then we're just going to talk through tips and questions and guidance, maybe even pray a little bit at the end. We'll turn the recording off and pray. Um, but before I do that, I want to talk about some things that can impact our prayers. There are numerous different things in the Bible. Uh, I hate to use the word conditions, but the Bible does use them as conditions. If this, then that. And then that is usually... Uh, your prayers are going to have some kind of hindrance, or they're going to be they're going to be not heard, maybe like we want, or not answered like we want. So we're going to go back to speed drills here for those who want to go. Everybody, get ready. We're going in the New Testament towards someone who shares the same name as the brother of. I know oh, it's the brother of Jesus, not the disciple who was killed by the sword. I'm giving somebody a hint. James, chapter four, verse two. We already read this one. What is it? You don't have because you don't ask. All right, ready? First John, you should be pretty close now. Chapter five, verses 14 through 15. There. Yeah. All right. What's yay? Good job. What's it say? Yep. First John, chapter five, verses 14 through 15. This is the confidence we have before him. If we ask anything according to his will. He hears us. And if we know that he hears whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked him of him. Good. So if we ask in his will, which we've talked about. It. So now you're praying in his will. This isn't just his name. This is his will. Somebody go to John 15, verse 7. Thank you, Hunter. Good job. So we need to be praying in his will for him to, to answer. John 15, 7 has a similar statement. He got it again. You guys need to speed up. Come on. Go ahead, Hunter. <laughs> Read this one. John 15, verse 7. If you remain in me and my words remain, <clears throat> and my words would uh, remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. How about that? If you are in the will of God, if you are in the will of God, anything you ask, will be given to you. If you are in the will of God, what kind of things are you going to ask for? Holy things. Holy things. What would, what did you just say? What's in, his What's in his will? If you're really walking with Jesus, if you're lockstep with him, if you're in accordance, you're going to ask for the things that Jesus would pray for. All right, so there's a condition. If you're praying for things that are not in God's will, he's likely not going to bless you with those. Now he answers God always answers prayers. He says yes, he says no, or he says later. Right? There's never a maybe, but it could be later, could just be no, or if you're praying in Jesus' will, it'll be yes. So I know that uh, Pastor Josiah has been praying for a Trans Am or some kind of muscle car, right? That might not be in God's will because he's already so far gotten no or later. <laughs> Let's go with labor. He's, he's gonna hold it. at some point that may he prays being if we're praying in Jesus' will, both those scriptures said that our the answers will be yes. So when God answers your prayers, when God answers your prayers, you know that what you asked for was in his will. And you're in the will of God when you see him answering in the affirmative these prayers. You, that's just one way to know. Sometimes God says no for our good, right? Always or later for our good or for his purposes, but we know we're in his will when he answers his prayer. How about this one? This one is so hard. First Peter 3, verse 12. Got it. I have a hard time with this because I'm a sinner, but let's hear this one. Uh, it starts in the middle of the sentence. Okay, back up and catch the beginning of the sentence. Okay, let him seek peace and pursue it. Because the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do what is evil. 
So God hears the prayers of who? The righteous. We don't like hearing that sometimes, do we? I, I just want them to, I want to do my business. I want to do, you know, I'll sin, I'll do this, I'll do that. And then I think what, I just turn right around and, oh God, by the way, this, 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 his ears are open to the righteous. Now Christ makes us righteous, but there is a sense there. He's not saying no to all your prayers because you're a sinner, but he's far more open to that communication. Why? Because sin separates us from God and righteousness brings us close to God. And so if you're wondering, God, why are you so far away from me? That could be a couple of reasons. You, you might be in some sanctification, but you might be pushing away from God in sin and not realizing. And it might be the sin that's causing some of that. That could be tough. Even just the sin of some other, it might not be blatant, obvious sin in your life, but it might be something like that. That's a tough, that's a tough word, but it's from God. And so if we want our prayers to be heard, we need to be in the will of God and we need to be seeking to be righteous. Um, having Jesus righteous on, on us as well. And obedient, that would be an obedient. How about, now this is a proverb, and we want to be cautious with Proverbs, because Proverbs are wisdom for good leave, living the majority of the time, they're not always perfect promises, but there's some serious wisdom to be heard in this one. Proverbs 28, verse 9. Josiah's really getting after this one. He's going to rip the pages out of his Bible as he's going so bad. Got it. Oh, Lisa got it. Proverbs 28, verse 9. Anyone who turns his ear away from hearing the law, even his prayer is detestable. Hmm. So disobedience is detestable. So think about this. You're disobeying God. You're in blatant disobedience to God. That would be outside of his will, right? And then we expect that he's just going to hear those sins that are outside of his will again. First Peter 3, 7. Man, this one's a real killer too. Oh, this so, who has it? Read it nice and loud. First Peter chapter three, verse seven. Husbands in the same way, live with your wives with understanding of their weaker nature, yet showing them honor as co-heirs of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Oh my goodness, men. Did you hear that? Live with your wife in a way that honors her. Uh, there's a mention of sort of that weaker picture it means you're the protector, you're the provider, you're the caregiver. And I don't mean like in the world standards, but just in God's standards, so that your prayers will not be hindered. So to live in God's will is to tend to your wife and care for her. Be obedient to God is to care for her. Again, we have that same, we have that same line of thinking. And husbands think, ah, whatever, my wife, whatever. God, answer my prayers over here. Make my wife better. I can't stand her. No, 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 it doesn't go that way, right? <laughs> you got to tend to your wife, and then maybe your prayers will be heard. But here's what's interesting. That says that you can hinder your prayers. That's what that was saying. That's a doozy. All right, I have this last one, which, which is what we talked about a minute ago, but another way to hinder our prayers. Matthew 6, verses 14 and 15. I have it right here in front of me. I'll do this. For if you forgive others their offenses... Your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you do not forgive others, your Father will not forgive your offenses. There's a parable that Jesus shared about a guy with a lot of debt. You remember the parable? Somebody tell me what happened. Somebody, let's talk about this. Who remembers the parable? A great king or a king forgave a man a monstrous debt that he had. A bajillion dollars. Yeah. yeah. And the. And so he forgave that wipe the debt clean. The guy goes out, finds a servant who owed him like a couple of days worth of like, money. Yeah, 50 bucks, 100 bucks, a couple hundred bucks. And uh, winds up throwing him in jail, demanding that he receive all the payment. Huh. Yeah, like demanding and, and choking him out. And the king calls him back and says, buddy, what gives? I forgave you this atrocious amount. I forgave you. Mm -hmm. And then you couldn't turn around and even forgive this guy who owes you a tiny bit. Now, what happened to the guy who the king, for the big, the first guy? King threw him in jail and said, you're going to stay there until you've paid off all your debt. So he, like, he no longer gave him all that forgiveness. That's Jesus' parable to us, the word to forgive others. This says, if you forgive others, Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive others, your father will not forgive your offenses. Now, this does not mean 
if I forgive people, I will automatically be forgiven for my sin because that would take Jesus out of the equation. But as Christians, as Jesus is the intercessor who dies for the sins that keep us from God, we're being asked, forgive others. You've been forgiven much. Forgive others the sins against you. There are conditions that can certainly hinder our prayers. You know what hinders your prayers the very most? What is the thing that keeps your prayers from being answered the very most? Not praying. Not praying. We're called to pray. The Bible makes it clear Christians should pray. It's assumed we're going to pray. We're commanded to pray. When we disobey that one, you don't have because you don't ask. You're far from God. When we're not people in prayer, we're not going to have our prayers answered. Think about that. And then you pray just one over here, one over there. Imagine for a minute if uh, some of you have kids. Let's use, we'll use this as the example. Imagine you have teenagers, and you would love to bless your teenagers, and you have all sorts of stuff for them, but you never see them. You never see them. They're out, you know, having having fun with friends over here, and they're going to the movie over there, and they're out working, over, and you never see them. And when you do see them, they're like, what's up, bro? Oh, and they're sleeping in, and you have no relationship with them, it seems. And then they come to you, and they expect you just, hey, hey, can you give me this? Can we have that? And then when you say, hey, how was your day? I don't even want to talk to you. Just give me the money and the car key so I can get out of here. How's that going to go over and over and over again? That is not, that's not a good relationship. Yet, how often are we treating God like that? I'm not praying. I'm never here to see you. I'm never reading from you. I never want to hear from you, God. I never want to spend any time here hearing from your word. Uh, I'm just going to pray and ask for a bunch of stuff. It, it kills me. How often I will hear that people never read the Bible. They've never read it in their life. They have had all these problems, and they come with huge, daunting prayer requests. I'm like, you, you don't want to spend any time with God in prayer. You don't really enjoy worshiping him, maybe in song and fellowshipping with the body. And then when you really are in need, bam, here's a prayer request. Here's a prayer request. Here's a prayer request. Give me, give me, give me. We're really not seeing God for who he really is in that, are we? Mm -hmm. Biggest and worst thing we can do is just not pray. Prayer is personal communication with God. Now, I want to talk about some tips for growing your prayer life, which is not what we read in Grudem's book at all, but I think that would be helpful. I'm happy to try to answer questions. I'm going to share some of my stuff. I'm going to ask you, maybe you want to share some of your stuff. We'll just see what would help one another. But I do want to suggest very much so that prayer is not one way. We hear from God in his word. We speak back to God. We worship him. We're speaking back to God. We're praising him. It's a two-way conversation. It's communication with God, not me making demands of God and then not wanting to hear from God. So this is an interconnected thing. God's word to us, our words back to him. Sometimes our words back to him, the, the words he gave us to pray, like the Psalms and things. So prayer is that. And if we get that in our thinking, I think it will really help enhance our prayer life. The next thing I want to do too is just recommend how many of you guys, I think all of you have gotten a copy of this book, giving you a copy, Praying the Bible by Donald Whitney. How many of you read it just by show of hands? It's a great, great, great book. It's easy. It's repetitive, unfortunately. You probably could have wrote it in half the pages, but it's very helpful. It's incredibly helpful. He talks about in very simple ways how to use scripture to pray back to the Lord. So I'm going to use his example. Now, he does have some rules in here. If you ever teach this, make sure you practice it right then and there. And that's not what this class is. So I'm going to not say we're teaching a whole prayer thing. But um, he basically discusses, and I would still encourage you to read it, you would go to something like the Psalms, read a script, one verse, part of a verse, and then take that as the prompt that would lead you back into prayer. When you've run out of things to say and in prayer, Go to the next thing and gives plenty of examples. And so it's God speaking and then you're speaking back and then you kind of run out of something or the subject changes. God speaks, you're speaking back, God speaking, and you're praying through some of that. It's not some magic formula. It's just an easy way to be prompted that I think will really enhance your prayer life. He says constantly, you know, this will keep you from praying the same old things about the same old things and being bored in your prayer life and having nothing to say and just being done with it. If you Want this book? I have copies here. You can take one and read it and give it to somebody else. I think it's I think it's incredibly incredibly valuable. Um, 
So that would be the first thing I would suggest. The next thing I want to share, I told you about the bookmarks. I'm just going to share something that I've done for quite a few years. Dave Early, who wrote, um, what is the title of that book? This Timeless Secret of High Impact Leaders? The Prayer, Prayer, the timeless, Prayer, the timeless secret, secret of High Impact Leaders, I think. Um, Dave Early is very, very serious about prayer. And he was one of my professors in seminary, and he planted a church in Las Vegas. We went down and visited him a few times. And, and actually, I went down to this thing that he did. He gave me this little book. So I used this book to jump into something that he um, was really serious about. He taught me in seminary, and I've used a few of these and filled up the pages. Basically, I just went and got a notebook. And then I've taken a bunch of the various aspects and ways I've wanted to pray and made them sections in my book. You don't have to make your sections the same as me. You don't have to do a book. If you do, you do what would help you to use a book like this as a prayer prompt or a prayer starter. So here's what my sections are. I have a bunch of, I have some quotes here. Um, these two are from Dave Early because he gave me the book, but I wrote them down. Nothing of eternal significance happens without prayer. And then he always used to say to us, ministry is nothing more than the overflow of Jesus in your life. And so I found those to be significant. I like I wrote my favorite quote on prayer, Oswald Chambers, prayer does not fit us for the greater work. Prayer is the greater work. Um, those are just good reminders for me. But then I have some scriptures in the beginning. These are the Great Commission scriptures and some scriptures about prayer. And then I turn the page. The next section of my book is prayers for the lost. And every time I meet somebody who doesn't know Jesus, every time I am praying, I pray for them. And I just have pages. I don't want to flip this around where you can see it, but I have pages and pages and pages and pages of, I mean, there's probably, what, a dozen pages. There's columns and columns of lost people. And then when people get saved, I cross their name off the list. But I just, most of the time, I pray for about 10 people. It's not very systematic. There was a time in my life when I would actually go, okay, I'm going to pray for this 10 then I pick back up and pray for that tent. These days, I just start skimming through it. And then whoever God really lays on my heart, I just pray for them. Some of these people I haven't seen in years. Some of these people I'll probably never meet in person. I have like the names of leaders and presidents in here and those kinds of folks that could be very influential if they were, if they were to know Jesus and follow him. What's really, really exciting in here is when you get to see the names of people you've been praying for and their names are crossed off. And I put the dates of like when when they're off. I'll, I'll share one. I've shared this a few times, but um, I have uh, way early in this. I'm going to have pages after this. I've known him for quite a few years. I have Kent in our church, written from a long time ago, and his name is crossed off because he's made a profession of faith, and I've shared that with him. I have the children in our church. When they make professions of faith, I cross them off. Baker, your son is in here, and I pray for him right? That's just a good reminder. Now, moving on, and I, some, some of these I put like, I don't know how I'm going to remember this person, so I put a little tiny note next to their name so I could kind of remember, oh, that was my neighbor on Lake Circle, and oh, that was a person I met at the city council, just because I sometimes I'm like, who the heck is that person? But anyway, then the next section of my book are ministers that I, that I know, and I have a couple of passages about praying for those who are boldly professing the gospel, and uh, so I have Ephesians 4, 11 through 14, Ephesians 6, 18 through 19, so that I'm just reminded, then here's my list of just pastors from all these churches in the valley and people that I've met and the pastors I'm praying for. Then the next section of my book is prayers that I will never cross off. I will pray for them forever. So I have another section where I talk about I cross off my prayers. These are not the ones I want to cross off. These are like Prayers for my children. I have some scriptures that I can turn into, please, and cries out to the Lord in prayers. Prayers for myself and being a good, loving husband. Uh, prayers for my wife. I never want to like, yep, God said yes. These are prayers I'm going to pray till my last dying breath when I can't pray them anymore. Then I have a section of intercession. This is my favorite section. I'm going to that right now. This is my favorite section because... This is how I see God working so much in my life. And I have just, I'm just pages and pages and pages I'm flipping through here. So what I do is I take a single line. I'm just going to kind of hold this up off the camera over here. I have a single line and uh, I put a date. And then I have just a simple enough line that I can remember. Like here's one and it's, it's crossed up. God brings six uh, solid men of good godly character to work with me to plant the church. 
That was 6 20, 2014. I started praying for that prayer. I have a date here. I'm just going to read this because it's fascinating. I have a date here. It says 8 10. What is it? 2017. I prayed that prayer for three years. Brett, I'm not going to read all the names on here. Josiah. But just a little tiny short line of how he answered. Sometimes I just line through him. Sometimes I write nope. <laughs> Sometimes yes. Uh, I have all sorts of all sorts of things in here. I have a bunch of when people say, "Hey, would you pray for me in this?" I write it down, and then when I see it come to fruition, I cross it off. I have prayers in here about Josiah getting a job at Ace. Then prayers with Josiah about getting a job. Uh, managing the lease. I have prayers that we'd find a good worship leader. And then I have a line that says, yes, Robbie, here's what's so wonderful about this. I have pages and pages and pages of lined off prayer requests that I can see how God's worked. Sometimes it's just a really healthy reminder to not forget to pray. I want to share one that I've been praying with. Well, there's a few in here I've been praying for a long time, but I want to share a specific one because I think we forget. And it's easy to forget. I got to go back here a few pages. Uh, I've been praying for this a bunch, and it's right. This is the intercession. Here it is. Section. Yeah. So on three March fourth, twenty twenty two, I wrote this. Please end the Ukraine war and stop Russia. So a lot of people put flags out, got excited, but then they they forget. I keep praying for all the things that aren't crossed off every day in my prayer time. And sometimes I just don't really want to pray. I'm like, oh, and I see that and go, yeah, I should pray for that. And yeah, I should. So in my intercession, I have numerous sections where I am, I am praying. I have a really silly one. I'm embarrassed to share this because we'll see if God answers this. On 6 17 of 2022, I wrote this Please bring my pine tree back to full health. <laughs> I have a pine tree in my yard that's been dead, but it's starting to get a little green. Can I ask you a question? What, are, what is going to be the witness of my pine tree if God says, okay, and that is a lush green pine tree? And I say, you know what? For three years, I've been praying that God would do this. I didn't do it. God did it. It's in my book. Put a resurrection sign in front of it. And right. it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have some prayers in here about people getting baptized that would love to see baptized. I have all kinds of prayers in here but the beauty is when you get to cross them off and you can say how about that and then you go back i mean i i could just flip back through pages and pages and pages there's there's prayer requests in here about wisdom about the merge and prayer requests. i mean just all kinds of stuff unfortunately not every prayer gets answered that way but i get to see man that was what god had in mind but it took a long time or it took no time sometimes there's a line in here that's like I wrote it down in the book and then, oh, wow, I got answered that day. It's like I just had to make an effort to write it down so for sure God would get the credit. This one's really unfortunate, though. January 19th of 2022, please help me get the painting finished in my house. That's on the honeydew list. And God, it's not within God's will. It has not been. <laughs> He's saying later. He's saying later. <laughs> Maybe my prayers are being hindered because I'm not supporting my wife. <laughs> the point, oh, and then I have some, sorry, I got it. That's this intercession section. I love that section. If you did nothing else but just write some of those prayers down. And then my back section, I have, when I find, so here's a section, just this is only for my benefit of hearing and following the Lord. So anytime I run across a verse in my reading, since I'm just going through the Bible, I write them down. If it's, about hearing the Lord and obeying, or not, or hearing and not obeying. So I have a section on obeying, and then I have a, another section where I write down the prayers and the benedictions, excuse me, in the Bible. Just because I, I love just seeing where those benedictions are and how people are praying. So this is just my little, I don't write big long, this is all the stuff I prayed for today stuff. I just, I write just the stuff I want to pray and want to see happen. And then when it does happen, I line it out. And that serves for me. And I put a date next to both. That serves as a journal for me that really helps enhance my prayer life. So I've been doing the stuff in here. And they have this, <laughs> they have this daily psalm recommendation where you take the date. 
So today is the fifth. Yep. Today's the fifth. And so you're going to look at Psalm five. You're going to pick five Psalms. You're going to look through them and pick one you want to use as a prayer prompt, as a guide. Then you're going to add 30 to it. So you pray for five. We're going to read, skim Psalm five, Psalm 35, Psalm 65. Where are we going? Psalm 95, Psalm 125. And that'll give you at least some things to look through to see if there might be prayer prompts. I love that. I've been doing that. Uh, I enjoy it. Sometimes I just barely get going and go, I'm just going to pray that. But praying scripture has been fantastic. So I want to encourage that. And then I gave you some examples from my book. Let's share some stuff here. If you would have something you'd like to share that's helped you with prayer. Do you have something that helps, that enhances your prayer life, that keeps you going well? Suggestions? Oh, we do another thing. I should have had the kids. They just walked out. Go to my office. I have this in my office and I have this at our house. We have an IMB calendar. It's a flip calendar of every day of the year. And on each day, there is a nation or a people group around the world to pray for. And it has a little blurb about them. And then it has like a red, yellow, or green, like if there's churches or not church work or no Bible in their language or whatever. And so my kids will get that. Today, we prayed for the Somali people who are refugees in the United Kingdom. That was the prayer request for today. So we pray for the nations every single day. If I were just to say, I'm going to pray for the nations every day, I would fail in that. But I have that calendar and I flip it. There's one in my office and there's one at home. So sometimes I'm with them when they're doing discipleship at home. Sometimes I get to the office and pray. You guys have a church planner calendar, right? And it actually has pictures by the week though, right? Yeah. Pictures, prayer requests. So that's another tool. All right, so what tools do you use that helps enhance your prayer life? Something that maybe I haven't shared. I have a book of Puritan prayers. Oh, Valley of Vision? Valley of Vision. How does that help your prayer life? Sometimes it helps me get going because I don't know what to pray. So Those I are hardcore prayers. All over, and then I start praying, and they are. They're hardcore. So then all of a sudden, my needs seem small. But, <laughs> but it just gets me thinking and praying they have a serious view of God and serious adoration of God, and they pray things that are just so profound. I have, I like that. I used to use, I did that for a, a good while. I haven't picked that up in a while. Every once in a while, it's a good one. The Valley of Vision, book of Puritan prayers. There's a good, you can buy a paperback. Anybody else have a suggestion? What else helps you to pray? What? What you haven't already mentioned? Yeah. But do you use some of these? How does it go for it? I really do, yeah. I the, the, the prayer book. Um, like the this yes. this book? You, well, well, you do well, that. Actually, I'm speaking of what you just shared, though. The, uh, the yeah, prayer journal. Your journaling. Uh, I started that back in January. And it's so awesome. Oh. Uh oh. I better pause the recording. We have cake. Mike, what's the best tool for what keeps you, what helps you the most in your prayer life? We talk about like a prayer journal, bookmarks, all sorts of stuff. What do you really find helpful in, in oh, Lord, your prayer not, life? That's not, a good not a good question. Okay, well, oh, I forgot one, though. I'll throw this one. I use Facebook as a prayer tool. I go through and I see people that I'm connected with, and they're posting who knows what. But that's a prompt for me to go, oh, I should pray for that person. Oh, I should pray for that person. You don't have to think of something. We're just throwing yeah, a bunch of have you, have you done that? Have you read this book? It's a great book. You should take it. No, I haven't read it. Here, take this. It's a really good book. I think it's good for your revitalization work, too. That'd be really this will be good for your encouragement. Prayer is the weakest link in my chain of discipleship. <laughs> I appreciate that confession. He said prayer. And we talked about that, didn't we? Prayer is the weakest link. And the you don't have because you don't ask. That's what we just <laughs> thank I, know you. All, I know all of the verses. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mike. Thanks for the cake. Thanks, Mike. All right, what else do you have? So social media, I do. I forgot. So I hide lots of people, um, but I don't hide anybody in our church. I don't hide anybody that I want to have a prayer uh, awareness of. And that becomes, even if they're just posting about who knows what, well, I, I see their name, <laughs> something about a trans am, what was it? I see their name, and then I'm like, oh, I should pray for them. And God sometimes will bring things to mind. So that's a helpful tool for me sometimes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I don't do that tool, and then I just get lost in endless scrolling. I'm like, what a waste of time. I should have been praying for these people. I thought it was ironic that Psalm 4 and 5 both are in that subject about prayer. Of course, David did a lot of that anyway. David was a man of serious prayer. Certainly. Anybody else have a... Just thinking back on Roddy, like that prayer journal has been the most helpful thing for me too because I started doing that too. It helps well, me be regular. Doesn't the intercession part get quite 
screen? Well, that's why I only that's why I only write one little line. I don't let it go to two lines. That way, I don't just bombard it. I'll just, hey, heal so and so. Hey, help. What was up for you when you pitched that idea? What was my I was like, I'm really struggling with prayer. And he shared, it was like, well, we probably need a gospel or a gospel. This is another book. We need a prayer project. Right. And so it's just a good way to like even look through and just like take a glance. It's not even like a daily thing that you're reading through all 500 prayers, but it's an opportunity to just look through and see if there's something pressing, something God lays in your heart that you can just pray over right in there. The cool thing, too, though, is a lot of them get crossed off and then I'm not praying for those anymore. You know, yeah. so I'm just praying the things that are there. And that's that's just been really helpful. Uh, I don't always vote for every section or like everything in every section, right? I'll pick a couple names from one section and a couple of prayers from another. Yeah. Section. Yeah. Yeah. So I also don't pray for all those lost people right. in one sitting because there's like 600 in my books, everybody I've met ever. Um, but usually there's enough in here that I can go back through and just see, okay, I just want to pray that. And a lot of it's just to help get me started. I think that's the key. And then God will usually bring a lot more to that. There's some things that I think more than anything, when you cross them off, you go, wow, that, sure that happened. Heard about it, sir. Yeah, it's just pages and pages and pages of lined out things, which is amazing. I keep a new notebook on stuff that I'm learning. It's not really a journal and it's not dated, but at the back is my prayer list. And I like the ones that you put online that like remind us to pray for people and well let, okay let's talk about that i know holly has a some but let's talk about that sharing prayer requests with others is a really helpful way to help all of us be praying so the prayer request the house of prayer group on realm and post stuff there big and small i mean just encourage one another to pray or at the end of a lot of these groups will do a how can we pray and here's a prayer we're not doing that on the recording but we have that option um, that's helpful for some. Sometimes that's not so helpful because then it either turns into a gossip session or what did you call the holy health care plan? Like <laughs> where it's just everybody's uh, health problems and someone sharing so and so as bunions or whatever. And sometimes we need to say, like, help me, I'm in this sin or help. Like we, it's hard in the class environment, but that's a helpful thing. Here's some time for prayer. Um, anything else? What else do you have? I was Go just going to say, in addition to the unreached people group, um, I used to pray through a list of missionaries that were supported by church. Oh, that's really good too. No, that we we need to be doing some of that. These are the missionaries we support and people we partner. Because you never know when that prayer is actually being answered at the same time that you're praying it. That's right. No, I mean that that's that's right. And missionaries need, I mean, having planted a church, serving in difficult places, hearing these stories from the missionaries I just met with last week, and I posted their prayer requests. And sometimes their situations are impossible. I posted the one about the guy with the donkeys. Uh, I'll share a little more to that. But he, he has to go to a place that you can't get to except for like by difficult boat, little tiny two-seater airplane over the bushes into a runway. Like it's an impossible place to start. That's the starting spot into the Amazon where he's ministering to this village. It's like 20 hour hike, something far away. That's where they start. And he, he was telling people, I need to figure out, and I'm asking you to pray. This was his prayer request. I'm asking you to pray for some way that we can get two donkeys at the start so we can not have to hike so far and they can carry our gear. He's asking for prayer. And the first thing everybody does the first thing you probably did is you went, well, what about a helicopter? What about it? You went to, I'm going to fix his problems. And he's thought through all this stuff. He, it's a country where the only people that own helicopters are the, the small military and the drug dealers. And so there's not a helicopter to rent out. And the airplane is, goes there super tiny. And the canoe is, you know, so narrow you'd have to like. And so people are like, well, what if you had a baby donkey? And everybody goes to the solutions. And at this thing, he raised enough money to buy like eight donkeys. But he's like, that's still not... I have an impossible solution that only God can answer. And I'm asking the people to pray. And it doesn't cost us anything financially to pray. And yet we're so much quicker to try to solve the problems, aren't we? Oh, well, I'll give them money or I'll solve it. Because prayer is the last thing we go to. Prayer is the last thing we go to. Prayer does not fit us for the greater work. Prayer is the greater work. Oswald Chambers, we have the missionary teams come out here. The mission teams come here. We just pray and pray. We go up on the mountain. We pray. We pray. There's always somebody that's like, when are we going to start doing some work? We're like, 
Believe me, the prayers of mission teams who have come here have been answered for years. We're still seeing answered prayers from some of the first mission teams that ever came here. Prayer is the work. So yeah, praying for missionaries, sharing prayer requests. All right, well, here's what I think we should do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna end the recording. And then I think just in here, we're just gonna maybe pray a little bit together since it'd be kind of silly to talk about prayer and then leave and not pray, right? Yeah, sure. Oh, here comes a tough question. No, we're not. No, yeah, go ahead. Lord, help me. What do you say to people that ask you to pray for them, but you're not for certain that their relationship with God is correct? Okay, so the question is, what do you say to people who ask you to pray for them, and you're not sure if their relationship is correct? Well, that's a really good question. With God. Their relationship with God is good. Well, I have prayed for lots and lots and lots of those people. In fact, we have that door hanger that's out on the table. We've had mission teams come out. We pray at every single home. Sometimes we knock doors and say, we're out here. How can we pray for you? People give us the craziest requests sometimes. Sometimes like that sounds so sinful and unbelievable or like I want to win the lottery or I just need to, whatever it is. Um, we pray for those homes. We'll leave them with that. Door hanger says, we're praying for you. On the back, there's a gospel message. There's a way they can get in touch with us. If they have more prayer requests, we hang them on the door. <laughs> we looked out across the whole city when we started and looked so daunting. Since then, so in the last seven or so years, eight years, we've put 113,000 door hangers on doors, prayed for individual homes. So we've knocked on a lot of doors and said, how can we pray for you? And We've prayed for a lot of people who do not know Jesus, but that's the point. So here's what we do. Someone says, hey, uh, would you please pray that um, something totally insanely absurd, that my neighbor's horrible, trashy house would light on fire and the eyesore of the neighborhood would be burned to the ground, right? Oh, imprecatory prayers. Here we go. So, so that doesn't sound right. So I'll say, well, I'd like to pray for you. So I'll start to pray. Hey, Lord, please, please, Lord, I ask that you would bless Bob. He's really frustrated with the way his neighbor's home looks. I'd ask that you'd help him to have graciousness in his heart. And Lord, I'd ask that you'd help to find a way maybe that the neighborhood or the neighbor could clean up the home. I'm not going to pray that God's going to burn the guy's house down. But I'm, there's a need there. And I realize that this guy's heart is struggling with it. And maybe they're struggling with it. And maybe God could bring some provision. Maybe God could bring reconciliation. So I pray for those things. And then I always pray for people. I always pray that God would draw people closer to him. Would you please draw Bob closer to you and bless him by his proximity and closeness to you. I usually don't when I'm praying with somebody say, would you please save Bob? But I pray that the second I walk away. So if they're in the neighborhood and about, you know, and we've prayed for you, we do that. Okay. They're far from God. I pray that prayer. Thank you. Hey, have a good day. I turn around and start walking away. And guess what I'm praying? Lord, save Bob right now. Change his heart. Let him be surrendered to you. And Lord, do provide the provisions for that home. That maybe we say, you know, whatever it is, um, just whatever. There's usually something there. Your well, answer is pray anyway. Oh, I can pray in the will of God. I'm not always going to pray everything they ask for. You know, I'm not, would you please pray that my, my wife would sign the divorce papers? Or blah, blah, blah. Okay, I might not pray that, but I might pray for God's will and reconciliation. I can find, I can find things in there. And I definitely, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray about everybody who's lost. There's a great line that says, you've got to talk to God about people before you talk to people about God. And we're just praying for them and praying for them and praying like, Lord, intercede in their life. I want to be like Moses who stood in the breach. It says, God would have destroyed them had not Moses prayed. That's what that Psalm 106 line says. Okay, I'm going to follow that example. Lord, don't destroy these people, but for your glory, save them. And answer their prayers in ways they cannot deny. You know, like like Balaam riding his, his donkey and the donkey starts talking to him. Like, that's kind of hard to, to deny what's going on there. Like, that's what I pray for. And I hope that God would answer it. I believe that's within God's will. I believe that he would have me to pray like that. We've been a- Jesus does that. Sorry, you were going to say, Jesus says, forgive them, Lord. They don't know what they're doing. When he's getting nailed to the cross, Stephen says, forgive them, Lord. Don't hold this against them when they're stoning him to death. So I think some of these prayers are good. You're going to say something. I was just going to say, we've been at like restaurants before where we'll 
um, pray for our meal, and then we'll ask our server, like, we're going to pray for our meal, and then you can use, sometimes they'll tell us the silliest prayer requests, pray for good tips, because they're taken off guard, and they clearly aren't believers, and they don't know what to, but we do still pray for that, because we feel like it's a silly prayer request, but we're being a, a witness to them that we trust in God, and that we love them enough to ask if they have a prayer request, even if it's something that at this point, I've just defaulted yeah. to always praying for good tips. <laughs> like, hey, we're going to pray that you have good tips, but how else can we pray for you? Because <laughs> like, but what we were just out at a, a place. I won't, this is on the line. We were at a restaurant and we said, how can we pray for you? And the lady said, please pray for my daughter's daughter, 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 and gave us shared some stuff. We're like, whoa, like it just so happened that God would bring these people to pray for this, this server. Other times people are almost in tears, but oh, it's so great that you came. So sometimes people are just far from God and say, don't pray for me, whatever. Then they walk away and we still pray for them. Or they have the utmost absolute situation. They're just blown away that we walked in the door. Prayer is a greater work and we're just going to trust God. And so I, we, I hope we're praying for lost people all the time and not just for their salvation, but even that God would, would bless them. You know, get up and walk. How about the blind people? A bunch didn't even come back and say thank you to Jesus. And one did. Like, okay, that were ungrateful people that were healed. And yet some did. I wonder how many people were healed or ate the bread when he fed them from the loaves and the fishes. And how many of them were in Jerusalem yelling, crucify him. Yeah, he still blessed them. So I just think his heart is to bless those people. So I pray for. Sorry, I mean, you got me all fired up. Somebody well, pray for me. I'm fired up. Too, right? Like, so you build relationships with people at restaurants in different places, and one day you show up, and the guy's son is getting arrested. Oh my goodness! Yes, I don't want to get into too much detail, but I'll share without. We went to a place often. There was an atheist who did not like me from day one, but we started praying. We started praying for their business. We started praying for things that this person would see being answered. And he was like something about that. Still didn't want to have anything to do with it. Didn't want to have anything to do with it. Didn't want to have anything to do with it. We're out with a mission team prayer walking. And the owner of the business and his son got in the domestic. They got in a fight. The cops showed up and were arresting both of them. And his wife came up and said, oh, you're that pastor who always prays at the restaurant. Please pray for my husband and my son. And I saw him and he said, please pray for me. There's a guy who says he doesn't believe in God. And that was, I mean, what, five years later? So this, he knew that we pray, even though he never wanted to have anything to do with us. But then, like the emergency, you know, case of fire break glass, he needed to, okay, now I'm in crisis. Now I need God. Now I need prayer. And the cops let me pray with him. He's sitting on the sidewalk in handcuffs, and our whole mission team is praying for these two guys with the police standing there. Like, it's just, I don't know. I think, I think because we were faithful to pray for him all those times when he said, I don't want to have anything to do with it. That then God would say, now's the time. Only God could orchestrate you walking up that day. Yeah, yeah. It just so, I, I love, I love the book of Esther because of how many times it just seems like, oh, it just so happened this. And then it just so happened this. And then it just so happened this. I mean, God has it all lined up and perfectly worked out. It's a great, it never even mentions God in the book of Esther, but you can see God working all throughout. I think that's what happens when we're personally communicating with him all the time trying to be in his will, praying for lost people? That's a super good question. Did I answer it? Yes. Okay, I just got all fired up. I just got all super fired up. <laughs> okay, now we only have five minutes left. So now I'm going to turn the video off and I'm going to pray. If you're watching the video, I want to encourage that you would take some time. First, this book is a great book. And if you're at Redeeming Life, we still have some free copies, I think. We'd love to give you this book. It's very tiny. Um, I just want to encourage you to pause or stop, and you just spend some time in prayer. I hope this was helpful. Thanks for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and stop this now, and then we'll pray.